The Raspberry Pi is one of my favorite tech gadgets, with the Raspberry Pi 4 being my particular favorite from the whole Pi lineup. Normally, you see the Pi 4 deployed in server workloads, perhaps as a network or a storage server, or in a desktop workload for things like web browsing, coding, and word processing. But I think the killer use case for the Pi 4 is as a mobile accompaniment to something like the iPad Pro. I've been using such a setup for around two years now, and although I've talked about this idea before, I've never done a full tour of the setup I've spent those two years refining. That changes today. If you see any part of my setup and want to hear more about it, perhaps see a tutorial on how to set that up for yourself, then let me know in the comments below. Now, some of you will no doubt be asking, why do this? Why bother carrying around a Raspberry Pi? Now, I won't spend too long on answering this question because I made a whole video about that linked above, but in summary, I love using my iPad, but I miss out on the full power of a full Linux machine. And with the Pi in hand, I get to have the best of both worlds. A lot of viewers contacted me to say that for them, the iPad Pi combo was a great gateway into learning more about Linux and learning more about coding. If those are skills that you're interested in developing and you have an iPad already, then buying a Raspberry Pi is a relatively cheap way to get going. Let's get started by taking a look at the hardware side of the setup. I'm running a four gigabyte Raspberry Pi 4. When it was first released, the Pi 4 had three memory configurations, one gigabyte, two gigabyte, and four gigabytes. An eight gig version was released later, but I haven't been able to get hold of one despite many hours spent trawling the internet. That said, in normal usage, four gigabytes has been plenty, so I'm not too bothered. I'll certainly get an eight gigabyte model when I can, but I'm in no real rush. More important than the RAM is the board revision. The short story is you'll want at least a Rev 1.2 board, which is what I've got, to get the best experience. The longer story is, well, longer, and it's not so relevant to everybody here, so I'll put a link in the description below to an article that explains all the intricacies about the different board re um, revisions. You definitely need a case for your Pi if you're going mobile with it. I've been using this aluminum armor heatsink case for around 18 months now, and I think it's the perfect case for a mobile Pi setup. I've dropped my Pi plenty of times with this case on it, and it's still fully functional. In the UK, this case retails for around nine pounds, depending on what color you get, and it provides a decent amount of passive cooling in addition to its protective shell. I typically access my Pi 4 from a second generation 11 inch iPad Pro. That's a non M1 iPad. I've had this iPad for just under two years, and previously I was using the first generation 11 inch iPad Pro. I connect my Pi to the iPad Pro using a USB-C cable. This allows the two devices to communicate over a virtual ethernet adapter and it powers the Pi from the iPad. I have tested the Pi with my wife's 12.9 inch M1 iPad Pro and it works just fine. As far as using them with the Pi 4 goes, all USB-C iPad Pros are essentially equivalent. I haven't been able to test this setup with any of the other non-Pro line USB-C iPads, but the Apple website suggests it might work with the USB-C iPad Air. I just don't know. If you have a lightning connector on your iPad, then you won't be able to use a wired connection like I do. Thankfully, there's another option if you can't use USB-C, and that's to power the Pi separately, say with a battery or a power adapter, and then connect your devices together with Wi-Fi. Have a separate video on that topic linked above. The Wi-Fi solution is great if your tablet doesn't have a USB-C connector, or if your USB-C connector doesn't deliver enough power, but if you can run with the USB-C connection, I really think you should, it's just such a seamless experience. A Pi, a tablet, and some method of connecting them is absolutely enough to get going with the mobile Raspberry Pi setup. You definitely do not need a keyboard or a mouse, but you will find the experience is far nicer if you at least have a keyboard. I have tried a ton of different keyboard mouse combos over the years, sticking with the Apple Smart Folio keyboard and Logitech MX2 Anywhere mouse for years. I doggedly avoided buying the Apple Magic keyboard. The price just made my eyes water, but I finally caved in and well, yeah, it's been the biggest improvement to this setup. I really wish I hadn't waited. The keyboard and the touchpad are both excellent for coding and writing work, and the extra power port makes this exceptionally practical for use with a Raspberry Pi. I can keep the Pi and pad connected over USB, and I can charge the pad at the same time through the extra port in the keyboard. I run my Pi 4 with a mild overclock, boosting the max clock frequency from the standard 1.5 gigahertz to 1.8 gigahertz. 
Overclocking is trivial on the Pi. Essentially, you edit a config file and restart. Overclocking does require a bit more power, but in this configuration, the extra draw is minimal. In the default setup, I measure around 0.86 volts standard versus roughly 0.9 volts when overclocked. I've had no problem powering either of these configurations from the USB port on the iPad. When overclocking, you do need to put a little bit of thought into cooling, but thankfully not too much. This isn't like cooling an overclocked PC. The Pi will throttle itself if temperatures get too high. This takes the guesswork out of the thermal management aspect. If your Pi is throttled, it's running too hot. That's all you really need to know. You can check if your Pi is or was previously throttled using the VC Gen CMD program in the terminal. If the output here is 0x0, which is a zero in hexadecimal, then your Pi is running unthrottled and you are fine. With the aluminium armor case, I've never experienced thermal throttling no matter what workload I've been running. As a test, I ran a really heavy CPU workload on my Pi while powered from the iPad for around about 35 minutes. The temperature peaked at just under 60C, the CPU frequency was almost always at its max of 1.8 gigahertz and no throttling was reported. The few frequency drops you do see on the graph here are just normal power management and not throttling. Although heat isn't really a problem when overclocking, power delivery can be. In fact, power delivery can be a problem even without overclocking. And the issue usually seems to come down to the cable you're using. If your cable is too long, too thin or worse, both, then you're going to experience some kind of voltage drop which results in throttled CPU speeds. As an example, I ran the same CPU workload test again, this time with the Pi plugged directly into a 60 watt charger, but with a long cable. The results are pretty damning. The CPU spends most of its time not at 1.8 gigahertz, but at a lowly 600 megahertz, and the vast majority of the samples show a throttled CPU. The takeaway here is that you need to get a short, thick cable. I've been using this Anker Thunderbolt 3 cable that I picked up for, I think, about £20 about two years ago. It's been fantastic. I'll put a link to it in the description below. That pretty much covers the hardware side of things. Let's now dig into the software, which is where all the real magic happens. The typical setup for a Raspberry Pi is to run some form of Linux, and my setup is no exception. I'm running the 64-bit version of the Raspberry Pi OS. RPI OS comes in three variants, light, desktop, and desktop with recommended software. The light version has no graphical user interface, so you'll be connecting solely using a remote shell over something like SSH. Now, SSH is my favorite setup, so I start from the light variant and build up from there, and I'll get into the details of what that build looks like as we go along. To get the USB-C connection working, you need to make a few fairly intricate tweaks to the OS configuration. I've linked to the instructions below, but if you wanna skip that, I've actually started publishing my own variation on the Raspberry Pi OS images that has the USB-C configuration already in place. And I've linked to those images in the description as well. On my iPad, I use Blink as my SSH client of choice. On the Pi side, I use ZSH as my shell, and I'm using Starship to get this fancy prompt. I like to use the JetBrains mono nerd fonts and the Dracula color scheme on most of my machines, and so I have the same setup here on the Pi. If you spend a lot of time in the shell like I do, then this amount of customization probably makes sense. But for occasional usage, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the default shell setup. In fact, for every other Raspberry Pi I own, I just leave the shell in its default state. Logging into the Pi over SSH requires you to type your password in every time. This is both annoying and it's not the most secure option you can opt for. I had Blink generate an SSH key for me that I sent over to the Pi and Blink provides a mechanism to configure the default settings for each host you connect to, one of which is the key to use. With that set, it's enough for me to just type SSH PiPad or Mosh PiPad and I'm connected. I don't have to type in my password each time. Speaking of Mosh, let's talk about the major annoyance of running SSH from the iPad, the aggressive suspend behavior. With Blink in the background, even for a few minutes, it's likely to get suspended, disconnecting from the Pi and losing your session state. Thankfully, you can fix this using a mix of two different programs that you install on your Pi, Tmux and Mosh. Now this video is gonna be long enough without going into the precise details of Tmux and Mosh, but in brief, 
Tmux provides a way to keep your session alive even after you disconnect. And Mosh provides a way to hide those disconnections that might come from poor connectivity, or in our case, from Blink being suspended. I've configured Tmux and Mosh as my default behavior for connecting to my Pi. And the end result is I can switch in and out of Blink freely without ever losing my session state. I even had the session survive an update to Blink. Even for casual use, it's worth your while setting up Tmux and Mosh. With an investment of maybe 10 to 15 minutes, you can get a really slick SSH setup on your iPad, allowing you to connect to any machine, not just the Pi. And I have a full tutorial coming up on that topic, which I'll link above and below once it's released. If you want to use remote desktop sharing, you might be tempted to pick one of the Raspberry Pi OS desktop variants. However, I suggest starting with the light variant and installing your own preferred desktop environment. In my opinion, the desktop environment in the Pi is not particularly nice to look at, and there are plenty of better options. I use Xmonad as my window manager on all my Linux machines, and I run a slightly stripped back configuration suitable for sharing over remote desktop on my Pi. Speaking of remote desktop, I avoid the built-in VNC support in Raspberry Pi OS, and instead I've installed Tiger VNC. I've been using Tiger VNC for a long time, so I'm more familiar with it. And one of the things I really like about it is that with a small config file, it's easy to create a dedicated VNC config that in my case launches Xmonad and in my case has the exact resolution for my iPad. I don't use VNC a lot, but for something like Firefox, it's quite nice and it's nice and fast over the USB-C connection. I've tried a bunch of different VNC clients on the iPad side, including the basic VNC viewer, screens, and Jump Desktop. I've settled on Jump Desktop because it's the least intrusive when actually running a live screen share. At $15 though, it's not cheap, so you might want to start with some cheaper options if you're just getting going. The app I use the most on the Pi, on most of my machines in fact, is Emacs. If you're not familiar with Emacs, think of it like a supercharged text editor slash productivity tool. If you're familiar with something like Notion, or if you've used an app like Drafts on the iPad, then you're familiar with a small subset of what Emacs can do. I use Emacs for the vast majority of my writing and coding. I use it as my to-do list, as my calendar, as my personal knowledge management system, my RSS reader, and occasionally even as my email client. I could go on and on about Emacs for hours, but I won't. Instead, I'll include a few links in the description to some of my favorite Emacs videos across YouTube. One of the primary reasons I use Emacs is that it enables me to keep all of my to-do list, agenda, and PKM data in plain text files on my own machines. This is some of my most valuable data, and I want it fully in my control. And to make sure this data is available on all my machines, I use the amazing open source file sync software called SyncThing. I've actually pretty much replaced iCloud and Dropbox now for all my file sync needs. And for the purposes of the Pi, I've configured SyncThing to synchronize all the Emacs data I use between the Pi and the rest of my machines. SyncThing is truly excellent and is probably worthy of a video of its own. So if that's something you're interested in, please let me know in the comment below and I'll be happy to film one. Coding is my main use case for the Raspberry Pi. And from what I hear from viewers, I'm not alone in that. The Pi is actually a great environment for working with most programming languages. I regularly work with Ruby, Go, Haskell, Python, and JavaScript, all on this single Pi. I don't wanna to spend too much time digging into each of those languages, but I think it's worth taking a look at three particulars from my coding setup. My Visual Studio Code setup, the Python setup I have with Jupyter for doing data science work, and then my Node.js setup that I have for working on the upcoming TechCraft website. Visual Studio Code is an incredibly popular, perhaps the most popular program as editor. Sadly, it doesn't run on the iPad, but it does run as a server on the Pi, which you can then access from Safari on the iPad. Now, running VS Code in a tab in Safari isn't the best experience. The keyboard shortcuts don't always work, and you've got Safari's window Chrome taking up valuable screen real estate. However, if you use the Safari add to home screen option, then you get a dedicated home screen icon, you get full screen rendering, and you get full access to all the keyboard shortcuts. I have a full tutorial on how to set this up and how to use this on your own Raspberry Pi coming up really soon. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out. Jupyter is an interactive notebook tool where you can analyze your data, create visualizations, and run machine learning algorithms. To install Jupyter on the Pi, I use Miniconda, which is a great way of installing and managing the Python data science toolchain on small devices. 
I run the Jupyter Notebook server directly on the Pi and then access the server from Safari on my iPad. This gives me a fully fledged data science environment. As an example, the temperature graphs I showed earlier were all constructed directly inside Jupyter running directly on the Pi where the temperature data was collected. If you're interested in learning more about data science or machine learning, this is a great way to get started without having to invest a ton of money in a fully fledged Linux computer. I'm currently working on a website to accompany the channel and I'm doing it entirely with the Pi iPad combination. I'm using a Node.js website tool called 11T, the details of which are mostly irrelevant, apart from one nice feature. As I make changes to the code, 11T reloads the browser so I can see the impact of those changes immediately. And for a really productive experience with the iPad, I'm able to open VS Code in one window and my website preview in another, and I can make changes in the editor and see them live as I code. Using the Raspberry Pi as a mobile device to accompany your tablet is a cheap and easy way to unlock a whole host of new use cases and avenues for exploration. If you already have a tablet, you don't need a ton of expensive hardware. A single Raspberry Pi 4 is enough, and pretty much all of the software, the best software for the Pi, is free. I've shared my favorite software packages, Emacs, SyncThing, VS Code, but this certainly isn't the limit of what you can run on your Pi, nor is it even the limit of what I run on mine. You can run Nextcloud to have a full productivity suite directly in your pocket. You can install Rasbap and turn your mobile Pi into an amazing travel router. There are more options than you'll ever have time to try. You need only pick your favorite one to get started. I hope you found this video useful and I hope you found it entertaining. If so, please hit like, please hit subscribe and maybe hit that bell too so you don't miss out on any of the follow-on content. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.